Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we pro proclaim the authority and reliability of the Bible. My name is Henry Smith. Today our topic is going to be something that's quite different. Fossil proteins and their relationship to origins, the age of the world, and the early chapters of Genesis. To help us explore the question of fossil proteins today, Dr. Brian Thomas joins us from the Institute of Creation Research. Brian, welcome to Digging for Truth. What an honor to be here. Before you go any further, I just got to say, I watch Digging for Truth, and I love it. And it's an honor to, uh, to actually appear on it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that commercial. We appreciate that very much. <laughs> uh, we're glad you watched the show, and uh, we are glad to have you on. Now, um, today, uh, in my introduction, I mentioned uh, fossil proteins, and a lot of people are probably going, fossil proteins? What in the world are those? Um, you actually earned your PhD in paleobiochemistry, that's a mouthful, uh, in a secular school studying this subject in detail. So maybe you could just introduce the audience to what we're going to be talking about here and a little bit of that experience that you had. Right. So, um, you know, when you do good science, it needs to be defensible. Um, and so we focused on, uh, when I did my work, we focused on the instrumentation. Uh, so we, we asked questions like, what instrumentation can we bring to bear on this growing field of biochemistry, biochemical remnants, and even whole um, tissue, chunks of tissue that we find in fossils? Um, for example, when you dissolve away the mineral part of bone, uh, there's some soft stuff still in there, connective tissue and even cells uh, still in there. So um, now the, this is huge. I mean, it's revolutionizing paleontology. It's like, uh, it's like the elephant in the room for those paleontologists who don't want to talk about it. And some don't because the stuff looks young. It looks fresh. It looks, um, looks like it was recently deposited, something like thousands but not millions of years ago. And so uh, how do you get, you know, young looking tissue inside something that's supposedly um, that we think of as millions and tens of millions of years old? So those are the big picture implications. But for my PhD, we focused on uh, the instrumentation uh, side of things so we could get so we could get through the program. Yeah, you know, and for audience members who, who are sort of getting oriented or maybe watching for the first time, it's our view and uh, your, your organization, ICR's view, that the biblical presentation of, of origins is that the world is young and, it was and the world was destroyed by a global flood. And that's a completely different paradigm than the prevailing paradigm. And I think I, what I hear you saying as a, as a matter of introduction here is that the scientific evidence as it relates to fossils really challenges that paradigm. Let's talk about that some more because you did your thesis on this. So, you know, what, what happened? You went to secular school, got a PhD, and you didn't give up your belief in the Bible. How about that? <laughs> How about that? And in fact, the data that I uncovered confirmed what I already believed um, because the this material looks young. And so, you know, I and I wasn't always this way. I mean, I I was I was raised to think that dinosaur fossils were from the age of reptiles millions of years ago, tens of millions of years ago. But then I started to encounter these kinds of uh, evidences that frankly, my teachers never told me. And so it's really, it's really an interesting time to live in because we have uh, the internet and we have different means of, uh, of learning things and being exposed to, to not just what the teacher says in the classroom. So now we could see for ourselves some of the soft tissues, connective tissues, blood vessels, uh, evidence of proteins, lots of different proteins, sequences of proteins. And these things really do look young. So as I'm researching it and I'm bringing new technology to bear on this, this burgeoning question of how, you know, how extensive is it? I mean, how many fossils should we expect to find tissues in? And uh, what layers should we expect to find them in? So these are the kind of questions that I've tried to explore. And the answers that I started to to uncover were, you, can, you might find it anywhere. <laughs> you might find it on any continent because it's been found on every continent almost. And you might find it in any rock layer. And so you could find it in the lowest rock layers that have fossils. And certainly uh, there's plenty of biomaterial uh, in the uppermost rock layers. 
and everywhere in between. So it yeah, looks we're, young. Yeah, we're going to cover we're going to cover that some some more as we progress through. Perhaps something you could do is give a little tutorial here on fossils because. We understand fossils, you know, somebody finds a fossilized fish, for example, and it's completely mineralized. It's completely been converted into uh, non-organic material. But maybe you could describe a little bit more about um, what you have found in the academic literature and maybe a little tutorial on fossilization for the audience. Sure, yeah, great point. Um, so fossilization happens uh, in a handful of different ways. Um, for example, you can have an organism that gets trapped in, let's say, sediment, and then it gets heated and uh, compressed. So it turns into a, uh, a carbon film. Well, that's an interesting way, and it preserves some you know, outline of the original creature. Um, sometimes the, uh, the, um, there's certain bacteria that will decay the carcass underground um, or under sediment, and so the bacteria will, will promote a specific type of mineral uh, to wrap around certain body parts um, and organs. So you can have preservation through minerals. Now the original organics are all gone, but the minerals outline the organs. So that's you know, what sometimes we call remarkable preservation. Uh, and then like you said, uh, Henry, there's um, mineralization. Well, there's per-mineralization, which describes a process where minerals precipitate uh, out of solution, and they fill the spaces or the voids that are inside a carcass or even inside tiny microscopic areas inside a bone. But then there's mineralization, where minerals uh, from percolating groundwater replace the actual bone. So you've got all these options in the world of fossils, but none of those are the ones I'm interested in. I'm interested in the one where you just have bone, and it's just old bone, like a like naturally mummified, we could still call it a fossil because the definition of fossil is the remains of a once living thing. So it could be a footprint in mud, or it can be a, a fossil that it doesn't have what we think of as fossilization. There's no mineral, there's no outside mineral that's replaced anything. And so you have, you have all these options. And in some of these mummies, dino mummies, there's original tissue, including blood vessels and things like that. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna explore that further as we end this first segment here in the next two segments. But, but I think the the essential point for our audience, and we'll develop this more, is the sensitivity of this material that that has not been mineralized, and the question of the paradigm, the prevailing paradigm of millions of years. How could it have survived that long? And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth today. We're gonna to explore this question further about fossils with Dr. Brian Thomas, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures for students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Brian Thomas, and we're talking about a subject fascinating to many people, the fossilization of ancient animals in the fossil record and how they relate to the early chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, Dr. Thomas, we were, you were just explaining a little bit about how uh, a lot of organisms fossilize. The point that you and I would argue is uh, we've got this stuff all across the world, and uh, rapid burial is required to preserve uh, these animals. But in particular, you want to focus on the protein part of it, where we actually have living, what used to be living tissue still there. So like, are we talking about just like one or two off discoveries? Or are we talking about something much more substantial? Well, of course, when I was first exposed, uh, I, I saw the now semi-famous photos that were published in the journal Science in 2005, and it, it's it's bright red because of hemoglobin, and it's it's got tan you know colored 
because it's made of collagen, the same uh, protein that makes up blood vessels and skin. The connective tissue is actually in there. And I saw those images and I thought, well, this is just super rare. Like there's only one of these that I've ever seen. And then I started to dig into the literature and I've been digging ever since. And we've been collating and curating a list of, um, uh, of publications from the secular scientists. And what's remarkable is, so now it's over 100 um, publications in the secular scientific literature of, of either biochemicals or whole tissue remnants inside fossils. And so, so, we're, so it's, a, it's extensive and intensive both. So it's a lot more than I thought it was. But there's so few people who know about it. Yeah, and, and so you're, the training that God and his providence has given you to be able to read this academic material, because you have to understand what it means, you have to be able to sift through it, you have to be able to understand what the scientists are saying. You, you say in the, what your one article that there's some ambiguity in the way they phrase things in terms of, is it really you know, organic material and that kind of thing. So it was, it was quite a bit of work for you. Well, work is what PhDs are about, right? <laughs> so, um, but it was it was a it was a labor of love, you know, because once you see the images and then you start to see, well, there's tissue there too, and uh, there too, and then there's biochemicals here and there, and I mean, Western U.S., Poland, Europe, and then there's some more in China. Paper just came out yesterday, and I'm, I've been reading that where they found um, chromosomes. In, uh, in dinosaur layers, you know, inside of a caudipteryx fossil. So, uh, so there's DNA that's now coming uh, to light, and it's just, it, you, could, you might find it anywhere. So how do we explain it? You know, how do we explain, like you said, it's, it's not just one. We're talking, it's, it's now, it's global. And so how do you explain a global effect? Well, we're thinking in terms of, of course, a global cause. Yeah, uh, it's in interesting. Let's explore that a little bit more. You mentioned chromosomes and DNA. Okay, so, so the prevailing paradigm would be, well, that dinosaur bone is 65 million years old, give or take. And you're, but you're talking about very sensitive organic material. I mean, this stuff gets destroyed very easily once the animal dies. Um, so m maybe comment on, on how easily that happens. It gets destroyed. And then the ways that the secular scientists maybe have tried to explain this in their paradigm, because it seems intuitive to me as a non-specialist, how do you make that work? Uh, okay, so let me just um, say two things about that. Number one, this audience in particular is gonna be familiar with probably the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so what are those made of? The material is parchment, from what I understand. And parchment is um, collagen, so it's animal skin. And that's animal skin that's been in the caves in Qumran for a couple thousand years. So we know it can last several thousand years in a cave. Um, but what about locked inside bone? And um, so we, could, we know it lasts a few thousand years, you know, inside of a jar um, in, in the desert. But what about, what about if there's mineral like packed right against the molecules? And so that might make it and help it last even longer. Uh, so what we do is we take bone and we artificially decay it in the lab. And so my secular colleagues began these kinds of studies in the early 1990s, and they um, produced decay rates. So we have biochemistry um, decay rates, and we the whole discipline is called kinetics. So we characterize the kinetics of the decay rate of collagen, and that's one of the longest lasting proteins. At least that's what we would expect because it's triple stranded. It's it's ropey and it's tough. And we know it's tough because of things like the Dead Sea Scrolls that have lasted so long, so many years. So what, do we, what are the conclusions? Well, the maximum shelf life based on these decay rate studies that we um, at the Institute for Creation Research have even duplicated along with some colleagues at the Creation Research Society, um, we're talking about fewer than a million years, maximum possible theoretical shelf life. So it shouldn't last that long. This is just based on like best possible scenario where there's no bacteria to, to chew it up. Uh, and um, uh, so, so best case preservation in a lab environment, um, no radiation to destroy these biomolecules prematurely 
uh, we can get it to last in theory for for maybe tens or maybe even hundreds of, of thousands of years, but not a million years. And so to find so many biomolecules, not just collagen, but even some of the um, shorter lived biomolecules uh, like hemoglobin and et cetera, elastin, laminin, uh, and like you said, nucleic acids, or at least evidences of them, is, uh, is we really this demands an explanation because it's so extensive. So if it's so short lived. Yeah, yeah. So if I as again, as a layman, you know, uh, you did a great job of explaining that if I if I'll say it back to you, you tell me if I've got it right. You created the most ideal circumstances possible for preservation and then scientifically would extrapolate how long that would last. And even at the maximum of, say, a million years, that still is far from the paradigm of 65, 70, 75 million years is the conventional ages. So what does that point is? What direction does this point us to, uh, Brian? And we have about 30 seconds for you to comment on that. Yeah, sure. Well, it's not just 70 million. I mean, we're the secularists have found and published um, protein and soft, squishy, you know, still flexible material from the lowermost Cambrian rock layers. And so these bear evolutionary age assignments of on the order of 500 plus million years, and yet it's still got proteins in it. So how do you explain this, um, this, you know, the presence of actual protein in throughout the fossil layers from the bottom to the top? Well, all along, we've been thinking in terms of Noah's flood as being responsible yeah. for the large majority of, uh, the, of the rock layers that, that uh, comprise most of our continents. And so that means that all the rock layers, or all the ones in question, were deposited uh, in just one year of the year rapidly. of Noah's flood recently yes. and rapidly. Excellent. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth, and we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here today with Dr. Brian Thomas, the Institute for Creation Research. We're talking about fossil proteins discovered in fossils all around the world, which we believe are evidence from Noah's flood. Now, Dr. Thomas, let's give the audience a little tutorial about the geologic scope of these discoveries. In our last segment, you left off with saying there's been soft tissue found in animals that are supposed to be dead for 500 million years. Um, now, that that's just seems incredible to believe. I mean, that it just that takes a leap of faith, I, it seems to me. But that's not the only th scope of it. Like, there's a lot more going on there. Maybe, maybe share about that. Well, the reason why it seems like and feels like it's a leap of faith uh, is because it is. I mean, it, it, it would be like walking into a, I don't know, a field or a room or some area, and you, you see a, um, a candle that's burning. And um, there's a pile of wax at the base of the candle. And you and you and you you're curious, so you think, now how long has that candle been burning? Um, and you measure the the amount of wax, and you measure the rate that the that the candle burns. And um, but but you believe that that candle must had to have been burning for 500 million years. Um, and so, but how how do you believe that? Um, so in other words, the belief of 500 million years flies in the face of the actual evidence of 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 what you're seeing, this fast burn rate, and there's not enough wax. I mean, you'd have to have like a candle that extends past the moon, you know, <laughs> and how do you, you know, to, to have been burning that long. And that's what we're asking. That's what our secular colleagues are asking us to believe is that these biomaterials, which undergo relentless chemical decay in accordance with the 
best known, best characterized law in all of science, the second law of thermodynamics, all systems tend towards disorder. And so oxygen reacts with these biochemicals. Water, uh, which gets everywhere, even under the earth, reacts with these biochemicals and turns them into dust uh, relentlessly. And there's no encapsulation that we know of that, um, that can keep this from happening. Um, so anyway, so that's why you feel that way. And I, and I sympathize with, with that. Yeah. Uh, and, and after, after that spiel, I forgot what you even asked me. No, that's, that's quite all right. <laughs> let's, let's, I think we gave the idea, you know, in these most ancient of rock layers, conventional dating, we're finding organic material and it just doesn't measure up to the empirical way that you would go about studying this kind of thing. Like you said, the maximum date based on experimental laboratory work would be a million years at the most, theoretically. But let's, let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about the geographic scope, because we mentioned briefly, you mentioned China. I have a quick list of places that you've listed in your research. China, Russia, Germany, UK, US, Canada, New Zealand, Argentina, and there's more than that. Let's talk about that. Okay, yeah, the great. Uh, so, so the geography is, um, is telling, isn't it? I mean, it's not, it's not like we have a special, unique pocket of some kind of magical preservation that's, you know, only here in Montana, where the, where the first most famous uh, discovery came out in 2005, T-Rex. It's not just Montana, it's, um, it's Canada. Oh, and it's, and, it's, and it's all those places you listed and others. And so, so what are the odds that you're gonna find some unique um, magical means to preserve, to keep that candle burning for millions of years in one place. Well, the odds are zero that you'll have that. But now to have the odds increase uh, against that position, because now we're finding these materials in every place, at, at least one representation on every continent, except Australia. And I think Australia, just we just need to do more exploring and we'll find some there too. So it takes a worldwide cause to best most responsibly explain a worldwide effect. And the Bible is clear. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And then that's Genesis 7 and then 2 Peter 3. And Peter believed this, the worldwide flood, just as it's exactly as it's written in yeah. Genesis. And he said that the world that then existed perished being overflowed with water. That world's gone. The whole world was overflooded with water and uh, that's why I think that I mean that that fits the worldwide extent, doesn't it, of the uh, of the distribution of original biomaterials in fossils. Yeah, and there's been people that have tried to uh, you know explain away Peter's understanding of that. You know, uh, well he just had first century misunderstanding or some other kind of thing. But he's he's paralleling his whole argument with the inauguration of the new heavens and new earth, which is a cosmic destruction. So it's a worldwide kind of event. And you know, in, but uh, real quick too, I wanted to mention, uh, you can comment on this and then we're coming down to the end here, that all the scope of the animals too that, you, that are in the research that you've, sauropods and mollusks, uh, T-Rex, insects, salamanders, turtles, on and on the list goes. So again, not a unique set of, of type of animal where these are preserved, uh, a, a wide scope, which is exactly what you would expect from the flood. Okay, so it's so that's what we found. So so when it, when we collated, uh, I think at the time we had a data set of eighty or so, eighty some odd examples of biomaterials in the literature, and so uh, we published um, a, a review paper on those in uh, expert review of proteomics, and uh, and so in our paper we 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 were able to put together uh, what just what you're saying. Hey, this is extensive geographically. It's intensive, it's in any geologic layer. Um, there's only a few that don't have representation of biomaterial in them yet, and that probably just awaits discovery. Uh, and like you said, it, uh, it's no respecter of taxa. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it might pop up in any, in any species or, or, or genera of, of animal, because, uh, and that's what we'd expect to see if indeed the Bible's right about the flood being real and a real part of, of world history. Well, thank you, Brian, for, for joining us and for sharing your insights on this subject. It's very important, and we appreciate so much the work that you do. Thank you. 
Friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. As you can see, there's just a, a, a small discussion between Dr. Thomas and I about proteins uh, found in these fossils, evidence for Noah's flood. The Bible presents this event in the, chap uh, in the early chapters of Genesis. The New Testament authors and Jesus himself affirm it, and so we can believe it, and the evidence is consistent with that. You can trust what the Bible says. We thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth.